Well, hello. How's everybody doing? Welcome to the White House. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Yeah, we can. Oh, let's, let's do this. I know sometimes it's hard, hard to know how are you supposed to act in the White House. Hey, everybody's sitting with their just just loosen up, loosen up. It's okay. You all are here. You're just gonna talk. I can tell you all talk a lot. So you're just gonna talk a little more right here in the White House. We are honored to have you. Welcome, welcome. Uh, let me start today by uh, thanking Paulette uh, for moderating today's workshop. Uh, Paulette is the new director of the Office of Public Engagement and uh, right here in the White House. And we're glad to have her on our team. I want to give her a round of applause, Paulette. <laughs> I want to thank Harrison Ford. I wanted to say that for a while. <laughs> Harrison Ford. So you think you trip because I'm here? I'm tripping out <laughs> because he's here. And look at this stage. Mr. Harrison Ford, uh, Chadwick uh, Bozeman. He's as cute as he was in the movie. <laughs> Just admit it. Outstanding. As well as uh, Brian Helglin, uh, who is here as well. You're going to hear from them. Uh, and I want to thank all of you young people here, because I want to make sure I know who's here. We have students from Gaithersburg, Maryland. Who are you? Where are you? <laughs> Maryland in the house. Alexandria, Virginia. <laughs> Guys are here. We got some DC kids. <laughs> of course, you all are the loudest ones. <laughs> it's OK. Um, we've got students from the Anemo Jackie Robinson Charter High School in Los Angeles. Have some of our LA. Where are LA kids? There you go. You can be louder. <laughs> it's okay. You all travel. Um, but I want to make sure that you know, all know how welcome you are here in this house. Because the truth is, we do these things. We make sure that we do these workshops so that you all know that this is your house too. Uh, so we want you to make yourselves at home. We want you to feel good and relaxed and learn and ask questions, okay? And finally, I saved the best for last. Uh, I want to pay special thanks uh, to a woman that I am totally in awe of. Um, and I'm not going to get emotional. I'm going to say that now because, uh, you know, I, I can tend to get emotional. But she's a woman of strength, uh, of courage, conviction, a woman who paved the way for me, uh, but she paved the way for millions of Americans all across this country. Uh, we have with us Mrs. Rachel Robinson. And this is what a beautiful woman looks like. She is a proud 90 years old. And I'm telling you that because she told me she's proud of it. And I told her she wouldn't have to tell anybody how old she was because she doesn't look a day over 40. <laughs> beautiful and smart and gifted and graceful. So uh, we are just so thrilled to have everyone here. Uh, now, the president and I, uh, we watched this movie over the weekend. It was just us because our girls were away. And they are definitely going to watch this movie. We think that everybody in this country needs to watch this movie. And I can say uh, with all sincerity that it was truly powerful for us. I don't know about you, but we walked away from that just visit, visi visibly, physically moved um, by the experience of the movie of the story. Uh, and it wasn't simply the, the wonderful performances because the performances were brilliant, brilliant. I mean, you know, I'm no movie critic, but you all are pretty good, <laughs> pretty good. Um, and it wasn't the, the, the wonderful screenwriting or the directing, it was the raw emotion that it just makes you feel after the experience. I mean, watching anyone go through what Jackie and Rachel Robinson did, you know, the outright discrimination they encountered at every turn, every turn from the fans in the stadium uh, to the airport receptionist, uh, even from some of his own teammates. Um, and you're left just asking yourselves, how on earth did they live through that? You know, how did they do it? How did they endure the taunts and the, the bigotry uh, for, for all of that time? And while so many in this country still face clear challenges, they still exist today. 
um, I was struck by how far removed that way of life seems today. I mean, there's work to be done, but things have changed. Uh, Major League Baseball is fully integrated. You can't imagine the Baseball League not being integrated. Uh, there are no more whites-only signs posted anywhere in this country. Although it still happens, it is far less acceptable for someone to yell out a racial slur while you're walking down the street. It still happens, but not tolerated. Uh, that kind of prejudice is simply just not something that can happen in the light of day today. And then on the other hand, for us to be able to sit in the same room as Rachel Robinson, we, do you all understand, we are here with Rachel Robinson. The woman who lived through that life, uh, whose memories and perspectives will forever be shaped by those experiences. Her presence here today makes us realize just how connected we are to that part of our history. It is very real and very tangible. Uh, in the end, I can't help but marvel at just how far we've come over the course of this woman's life, uh, but it also reminds us how far we have to go, how much more work we have to do. Jackie and Rachel Robinson's story reminds us how much, how much hard work it takes to move a country forward. Uh, it reminds us how much struggle is required to make real progress and change. So as you reflect on this story, uh, not just today, but I hope you keep thinking about it for the rest of your life, I want you to think about how much strength it took uh, day in and day out for Rachel and Jackie Robinson and for thousands of other people just like them all across this country to keep pressing ahead, uh, even though some folks wouldn't even treat them like they were human beings. They just kept pressing ahead. Uh, it would have been easy for them to get mad, right? Because I know I was mad <laughs> just watching the movie. It would have been easy for them to get mad or to give up. But instead, they, made hate, they met hatred with decency. I want you all to keep that in mind. They met hatred with decency. And more importantly, they gave their absolute very best every single day. Do you hear that? They, they gave their best every single day from the time they were young people, just like all of you. They worked hard to prepare themselves for greatness so that when the opportunity came their way, they were ready for that greatness. You know, this would have been a totally different story had they not been prepared, had they not trained themselves, had they not educated themselves. Yeah, Jackie Robinson certainly was a tremendous athlete, uh, but he was so much more than that. You know, he bravely served in our armed forces. Uh, he attended college at UCLA. Uh, he competed at, as hard as he could at everything he did so that his gifts wouldn't go to waste. And Rachel Robinson, was in every way his equal, ladies, in every way his equal. She made her education a priority. She worked hard in school. She eventually became a nurse. Uh, so Jackie and Rachel Robinson weren't destined for greatness. They prepared themselves for greatness, which meant that they could make a difference outside of baseball as well, and that is the only thing that is important for you to understand. You can be great in your profession, you can earn a lot of money, you can be famous, but the question is, what are you doing for others? After he retired, Jackie Robinson became a leader in the civil rights movement, working with Dr. King, the NAACP. Uh, he helped to start a bank to help other minorities start their own small businesses and to own their own homes. Uh, and after his death, Mrs. Robinson carried on that legacy by starting the Jackie Robinson Foundation, which has provided college scholarships and training and career opportunities for more than 1,400 underserved students. In fact, I know that we have a few Jackie Robinson scholars here today who are studying at Howard and Georgetown and Yale and Brown and even my alma mater, Princeton. Righteous. <laughs> And, and I have seen the quality of these scholars firsthand because one of my personal assistants, little Kristen Jart Jones, uh, was a Jackie Robinson scholar in 2003. And I couldn't be more impressed by the work 
that she has done and the young woman that she has become. Very proud of you. And more than anything else, that is Jackie Robinson's legacy, opening up a whole new world of opportunities to young people like Kristen and every single one of you here today. And that's why it was so important for me to have all of you here for this event. We intentionally did this. Now we're gonna have a screening for a bunch of fancy people somewhere later on down the line, but we wanted to be here with you. Uh, because this isn't just about watching a wonderful movie and about, about an important moment in history. This is about helping all of you believe that you can write your own history. And I can't say this enough to enough young people. You might not be able to hit a ball like Jackie Robinson, but you can get your education. In fact, you must get your education and demand more of yourself every single day. You have to do that and you have to pick up yourself when somebody knocks you down because you will get knocked down. Uh, but to do all of that, you have to put the work in. You know, that's all I have to say. All of this is about hard work and you have to be willing to face any obstacle you might encounter along the way. That's what Jackie and Rachel Robinson did, and, and the same could be said for all the folks on this stage, quite frankly. Uh, before he became an actor, Harrison Ford had to overcome a crippling fear of speaking in front of an audience, so he's terrified right now. <laughs> and it took Chadwick 10 years, uh, 10 years of hard work before landing his first starring role. So this stuff doesn't come easy. And then Brian you know, sits down to create a script, and that means hundreds of hours of writing and rewriting, painful doubting and rewriting. <laughs> oh, you can see the pain <laughs> before he comes up with a finished product. Uh, and, and that's really the secret, you know, and I want all young people to understand, what does it take? What does it take? What's the secret? The secret is that no one comes out a finished product. None of us are finished products. There is no magic that makes someone an actor or a director or a doctor or a lawyer or a president or first lady. There is no magic. That is the one thing I want you all to understand. If you gain nothing from this movie or any of our lives, there is no magic. It takes grit, takes determination, and a whole lot of hard work. And as you saw in the movie, it takes guts. So as you think about the obstacles you face in your own life, as you hear someone telling you that you're not good enough or that you don't belong, I want you to think about how Jackie Robinson got up and played after he got spiked in the leg. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about how Rachel Robinson is still working to make this world a better place at 90 years old. She is still not stopping. You can rest a little bit. <laughs> And then I want you all to put your heart and soul into everything you do, every single thing you do. Can you promise me that? There, there is no exception to that rule. Everything you do, you have to do 120%. And, and you all are capable of doing that. Everyone is capable of doing that. And that's gonna start right now. Your first test of how passionate you're gonna be is right here today because I want you all to take full advantage of what we have for you. I want you to ask questions. I don't want you to hesitate. I don't want you to be shy because the first step in greatness is just using your voice, just knowing that whatever question, whatever thought, whatever ideas that you have have meaning and relevance in the world and you will not hesitate to make your voices heard. Take advantage of these folks. Make sure you understand and ask questions and push and drive and when you leave here, I want you to promise me that you're gonna keep doing that every single day, no matter what you wanna become in life, that that is how you're gonna lead your life, with greatness, with focus, with drive, determination. And when you do that, and I know you will, you will be something great. Don't know what it is. I still don't know what I'm gonna do with my life, but you will be something great. You all have everything it takes to make that happen. And it is an honor for me to be here with you guys. Have fun, I gotta go work, but I'm gonna get a report on what's been going on here today. So talk and ask questions. Thank you guys.
before we get started, I'm going to invite the producer of the movie, Thomas Tull, to come and join us up here and say a few words. I want to thank our PR folks for doing that. You know, next. So, um, did you like the movie? Yes. Um, I'm one of the luckiest guys you're ever going to meet because I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York, and the chances that I'm standing here at the White House talking to you about this film is incomprehensible to me. We've had the great fortune at Legendary of working on the Dark Knight series, 300, Inception, Hangover, which I'm sure none of you saw. <clears throat> but the most important movie we'll ever make is this movie, is 42. And I think we all owe a debt of gratitude, and this country does, to Mrs. Robinson and to Jackie Robinson and their family. And I'll, I'll leave you with this. I, I, in the very fortunate position I find myself in, I get to meet fancy people all the time. Acting stars, athletes, all kinds of folks. And for whatever reason, I've just never gotten nervous. But when I went in for the first time to meet Mrs. Robinson, I was nervous. And uh, you, it's hard for me to convey to you the class, the grace, and how grateful we are that you let us tell this story. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Thomas. We are going to get started with our panelists today. Um, I will just make sure that um, we start with Chad. Um, who got a chance to play Jackie Robinson in the movie. And I wanted to ask, is there something that you learned about Jackie Robinson and the influence that he had through this process that you, that you maybe didn't know before, um, his influence on baseball and beyond? Uh, there's a lot of stuff I learned. Um, should I look at you or look out? <laughs> is it okay? Look out. Uh, well, I think what was important for me was to to know his life before the movie starts. We're, we're covering a short period of time. Uh, Brian, I've heard him say before that, uh, that time is the enemy of the drama. So it was important, I think, that we told this, this short span of time because you get more of the details and more of the subtlety of the person and so I needed to know in order to, to show you that subtlety, to, to see, um, you know, in the nonverbal uh, things about him that maybe you didn't know just from reading the books. Uh, who was he before? Um, who was he before he broke the color barrier? And he was already a great person before he, he did this. I mean, he, he was already known as one of the most all-around athletes in America. In fact, that was uh, one of the headlines, that he was you know, the Jim Thorpe of his time. Uh, he was a better football player, possibly, uh, a better basketball player, um, better at track and field, broke his brother's um, you know, record in the broad jump, and his brother was an Olympic athlete who finished second to Jesse Owens, um, finished with a silver medal. And so knowing that and knowing that he, you know, because a lot of you will, will try a lot of endeavors in your, your lifetime, in your careers, and you'll change. You'll find that you did something for a certain amount of time and then later on you, you realize you need to do something else. The fact that he, that he did this in baseball, which wasn't necessarily his best sport, and that he developed the skill in that to reach the highest level. Um, that was amazing to me, and it said to me that you know, he, had, he already knew 
that he he could achieve excellence, whether it be the Army, football, basketball, even tennis he played, that he already had that in him. So uh, to me, that was one of the most important factors of sort of playing his 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 iconic nature um, was that he was going to do this whether it was baseball or something else, he was going to do something to change his surroundings. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Brian. Um, I think we can all agree that there were some amazing casting decisions in this movie, and I wanted to get a sense of how you went through that process. Um, yeah, it's always... Um it's tricky because it's real people. Uh, a lot of the characters in the film, or almost I think almost all of them, are real people. Um, so I had done as much research as I could to try to get a sense of who everyone was. Um, but at a certain point, you just kind of forget about all that and, and try to see who captures sort of a feel of the person rather than, than a... a anything else and um, I just I'll just speak about these guys because they're here but um, Chadwick came in um, it was the second of probably 25 actors who came in for the part and he he chose a very I thought a very brave performance in his audition he didn't the, the, the scene where he's in the tunnel where he breaks the bat that was he did that scene I mean, he, he was going to do that scene. He had to do that scene, but he, I think um, he did it first, and he did it with a wiffle ball bat and a chair. And basically, what he did in the room in front of me was what he did on screen, and a director doesn't do it. <clears throat> a director doesn't really do anything except say, move a little to your left or move a little to your right. And uh, so Chad came in and, and did that and, and, and chose such a brave way to go, whereas a lot of actors come in and they, they do a kind of down the middle uh, performance because they don't want to get eliminated right away. But he came in and said, look, you're going to either like me or not right off the bat and, and we're going to know in five minutes. And, and he left the room and if it, was, uh, you know, if it was the Olympics and it was the high jump, he had just cleared the bar that everyone else had to get over and no one else ever got over it. And um, and he has to play, play the, the, one of the bravest men who ever lived, so I thought that he came in brave was a great indication. Um, Harrison, on the other hand, was... Uh, I worried about Harrison because I thought he's... He, everyone, he's, so, he's such an icon on, on film, and everyone knows him for all these parts, and I thought really Branch Rickey had to be a character actor because I thought he had to disappear. The actor playing the, the part had to disappear. And um, I was going to tell him all that when I met him to dissuade him from being interested. And he beat me to it. And he said, you know what, this guy's got to I have to disappear. And, um, you know, he told me how he wanted to disappear into the part and look different and wear a, a, a suit to bulk up and change his, his face and change his hairline and change his voice. And I remember he had his first hair and makeup test. And I said... Um, no one's going to recognize Harrison Ford. And he said, oh, that guy. He says, but I think we've seen enough of him. <laughs> and, um, which it was the perfect spirit of, 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 of him wanting to serve the story and um, knowing that, and everyone, I think, not just him, but everyone knowing that this story was bigger than any of us uh, trying to tell it. And, but he led the way there with... with wanting to, to put Har leave Harrison Ford at the door and walk, walk through the door as, as Branch Rickey, which I think he did great. Wonderful. That is a, a great prompt for our, our next question for Harrison. This was a, a really amazing character, and there was a very powerful scene where um, the character talked about ha not having the guts not to fight back, and I wanted you to share with the audience what your thought process was and, and sort of what that scene was like for you. Well, I'm going to tell you, first of all, frankly, that I have no memory whatsoever of thinking about it. It was, uh, I was blessed with wonderful words and a truly talented actor to work with and a director who um, had written those words. And um, 
You know, my job is to be useful, to help tell the story. And Branch Rickey was a wonderful character, and there was a, a bit of complication in the scene because his behavior was a test for Jackie Robinson, and it was um, a tough test. It was a test uh, for Branch Rickey as well. And uh, I, I simply thought of it as a, as a wonderful opportunity. And um, the, the, the trick of acting and it is not really a trick, is uh, to be there, to be present with the person that you're talking to and to um, recognize that what is true um, is what transmits uh, across the screen. The language of film is, is emotion. And if you can truly be emotionally truthful, um, then uh, the message will be received. And to work with somebody as talented as, uh, as Chad is, and to see the steel that he brought uh, to the test was inspiring to me. And um, but behind everything here was the knowledge of what Jackie Robinson uh, was able to do, what Jackie and Rachel were able to do for us all. And uh, to be part of the telling of that story was for me a great honor. Wonderful. Rachel, the next question is for you. There are very few people who knew Jackie like you did, and we wanted to see what you thought he would think about all of this, the movie coming out, so much attention on the story, and just get a sense from you about what, what you thought he might, he might say. Well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm so happy to see the students here. Uh, part of what's exciting for me and, and makes me feel joyous is the fact that this film uh, is going to be able, it will inspire uh, many of you to uh, think about your own lives and 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 do what you can do with with the opportunities that come your way. Um, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I I had been asking how how he might feel about all the the movie coming out and the attention on on your story. Okay. Um, when I met Jack at, on the UCLA campus, I was a freshman and he was a senior. And he was what they call big man on campus. <laughs> and I thought, when, the, when a, one of his fellow uh, players came, teammates, brought him over to meet me, I thought, oh, he's going to be arrogant and uh, impossible because he has four letters and everybody uh, looks up to him on campus. And anyway, when he came over, he was quite different. And I think I fell in love with him right then because he was humble, he was, he, the sense of humility was so great in him, and this is connected to your question, because I don't think he would ever have dreamed of having this kind of uh, film made of him, uh, or the uh, attention given to him as a hero, because that wasn't what he was looking for in life. Um, so that uh, I think he would be pleased, I hope he would be pleased, we worked very hard to get this done, um, but I don't think he expected it and I don't know that he would uh, be so uh, excited about it. He had other things to be excited about. Absolutely. Tell us a little more about the things he was excited about. Well, um, Jack passed in 1973, 72, and um, my son, Jackie Jr., was killed in an automobile accident in 71, and my mother died in 73. And it was the most devastating period of my life. I felt like I had fallen into a deep hole and had to find a way to get out because I had two other children waiting for me. So that some of the uh, ideas that were, are generated at that time and during that process of, of those ideas, a film was one of the things I had hoped we'd have 
a chance to make and have a chance to bring Jack's life before uh, the public and also have the legacy live on in a number of ways. And that was uh, my, uh, that's what inspired inspired me to try to get the foundation going, get the f movie going. Well, 30 years later, we're still trying to get a movie. Uh, we had a number of producers who came to me who said they wanted to do the movie, but they didn't have the resources until Thomas came. And then when I met Thomas, even the first time I met him, he, he made me believe, I, I felt confident that he was gonna be able to do this movie. He, he had already thought it through, he had the idea, he had the uh, commitment, he had the courage to do it, and he had the resources that are necessary. And there are, you know, in, you can have ideas, but you gotta find a way to, to carry them out. So that um, my excitement about the film uh, has been um, tremendous because we've finally gotten something done and it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. The movie itself was um, very historically accurate. I wanted to ask Brian about that process generally. Um, what type of research did you do and how accurate do you think it was and, and what did you use in order to accomplish that? Well, the great, the great thing for me as a writer is that that time period and that year are so documented by biographies and, and Jackie's own autobiography and newspaper accounts, and Red Barber, the sportscaster, wrote a book about that year. Leo DeRocha wrote an autobiography that has a chapter about that year. So it was great resources. And, and you kind of put all that together and tried to find, because everyone exaggerates one way or the other, their own importance, and um, naturally. And um, you try to find the truth, the spirit of the truth, in the middle of all that. And, what I tried to do was never have a scene that I didn't have some proof happened in some form or another that someone hadn't had an account of. Um, um, there's a, a couple of exceptions in there that I, that I did for dramatic reasons that I thought the spirit of them were true. Um, but as far as when, when you get just down to making it, then you just get a bunch of great people, the production designer, and you get the guy who knows where every old car in, in Alabama is, you know, and drags them all <laughs> to the set and um, tells you which ones will run and which ones won't run. And so it's, it's a lot of just hard work of, of uh, people running down the street and pulling down signs and the effects guys painting air conditioners out of the windows so they don't show up. And um, it's a lot of people doing a lot of hard work and, and giving everything they got, really. Wonderful. And did you have a lot of people who were there at the time to help, to help you out? Will you walk through kind of working with them, particularly Rachel or anyone yeah, else? Yeah, no, um, uh, Ralph Branca was very helpful, the pitcher. But Mrs. Robinson obviously was the, the, the end of the line, you know. And um, I told this story about her last night, but I'll quickly tell it again. When I had finished the script, I, it was sent to Mrs. Robinson, and we're all waiting. And, no one knows what she thought, and I finally got called, and I left Los Angeles. I talked to Thomas, and I said, what does she think? And he's like, no one knows what she thinks. She's not saying. <laughs> so we did everything we could. All our intelligence turned up nothing. And um, I got to her <laughs> office, and I'm waiting, and I'm sitting there, and she walks in, and she has a script. And um, I should say, first of all, the, the scene with the Bach, where the guy Bach and Jackie scores, in the original script, um, because a Bach is such a difficult thing. I still don't understand what a Bach is. But it's so hard to understand. I had Mrs. Robinson, her character, turn to Wendell Smith and say, what happened? And he describes the Bach to her. And in the movie, it's, it's little Ed Charles and his mom. But she came in. I didn't know what she thought. I was petrified. She had a script that had folded corners and post-its sticking out of it. And I'm just like, it's over. And um, she said, I read the script. And I said, no, good, great. And she said, let me ask you a question. And I said, yeah. And she said, in what world do you think I don't know what a Bach is? <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, it's a very hard thing to understand, and I need someone to explain it for the audience. And she said, well, have someone else explain it, but don't have it be me. <laughs> and, but that kind of thing 
carried all the way through. That's a funny version, but, but, but we had her eyes on it, and that was a, a blessing. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for being here today to walk through a little bit of how this movie was made and, and the pieces that you all played in it. Um, I'd love at this time if I can invite Thomas on stage and we'll give everyone a round of applause. Um, we have time for questions. Oh, great. Questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Um, I got the wrong cue. Apologize. Um, who has some questions um, for the panelists? I bet we've got one in the back. Yes. To Mrs. Robinson, um, do you believe that, um, I'm sorry, Jackie's legacy continues on today in the African American community, or is it somewhat lacking? I do believe, I do believe that it is important to the African American community today. Um, we have made great pro social progress in America, but we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, it's not a perfect world. And um, I think that the African American community, while um, they have had white pe people taking the lead in a lot in some things, they're now taking the lead, and they have been since the Civil Rights Movement, taking the lead and wanting to make the changes, them, create the changes or, or give uh, leadership to the, to the changes. So I think that, um, that Jack is well respected in that community, in our community. Do we have another question from the audience? Is there anyone over here? Yes. Um, this one's for Ms. Robinson. And um, I was wondering, what was it that drove you to um, accomplish everything that you and Jackie accomplished during this rough period? Like, what was your main motivations for persevering? Hmm. Uh, we were put in a situation, we found ourselves in a situation. Jack and I had, uh, were engaged for five years, and we had decided that we would not get married until I graduated from college and he had a job. <laughs> and uh, the J-O-B was very important. <laughs> So when these things happened almost at the same time, I graduated and then Mr. Ricky came forward and so we had, um, we had the thing that we had planned to, uh, our, our plan was moving forward at that point in time. What was your question? <laughs> what was your main mo motivations for post? Excuse me, what were your main motivations for persevering? A main motivation for persevering was we wanted a uh, full life, a decent life, and as Jack always, uh, we have a quote that Jack has used a lot in his books and on his speeches, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. And so that it was not just our own lives, but we wanted to have some impact in the society, and that, we had that determination we had from a very early age. And uh, I think we tended to think of what people call obstacles, we tended to think of them as challenges, something you had to address, you couldn't walk away from it. And uh, so that, that was another motivating factor because there were a lot of challenges in, in our time. Do you have a question? I, um, my question is for Mr. Thank you. I appreciate it. My question is for Mr. Ford. If Wikipedia serves me accurately, you were, <laughs> you were a lad at the time um, that all of this was playing out in real life. So in the film, your, your character stated that he wanted to pretty much vindicate something that had happened in his college years and not stepping up for a teammate. So my question for you is, at any point in this film, did you feel as though maybe you were vindicating times um, of your life past? Question. Uh, to be frank, the thought did not occur. Um, I grew up uh, in a, a family of very uh, 
I was very, my parents were very liberal. Um, they embraced social change and they embraced um, um, equal rights for all. And um, we didn't know much about baseball and what was happening in, in um, the Robinsons' life was not much uh, a subject of conversation, to be frank, because um, it didn't, it didn't um, manifest as, as a, as a uh, civil rights issue. Uh, and later when, when baseball met the challenge to break the color barrier, and civil rights became a dinner table conversation. My parents were very vocal about how important it was for us to understand our American history and what had been done and that we now had an opportunity to redress that situation. And by the way, I agree with Mrs. Robinson that we've further yet to go. But I don't remember that I was ever challenged um, by an opportunity to feel um, different or superior to anyone else. I think the, um, the truth of that seed, and there certainly is a great truth to it, is that um, I think three times in the film, um, Branch Rickey is asked why he's doing what he's doing. And he gives at least three different answers. But when finally pressed by, by Jack, by Jackie Robinson, um, he feels compelled to give the true emotional answer, is that baseball is a game he loves. There was something at the heart of baseball that was unfair. And then he told about the experience with um, a fellow player when he was a, a coach player at Ohio Wesleyan University. And um, I think it's a very important scene uh, for me. And, uh, and I was uh, very pleased to have the opportunity to participate in this so, so there's a uh, there's a conventional answer, and then there is the deep emotional answer to these kinds of questions. Why you do that? And one of the genius things about this film is that we don't talk about the story. Brian didn't write a script in which you talk about the story. This is a film which gives the audience the experience of being there the experience of, of feeling viscerally what it was like to meet the challenges that Jackie and Rachel faced. The visceral experience of what Jackie Robinson went through and what kind of a guy he was. So that's, that's the genuine pleasure for me as an actor to, to be a part of this story. Sort of a long answer to a easy question, but thank you. Thank you for asking. Yes, in the back. Um, this question is for Chad. Um, I wanted to ask, um, how has playing the role of Jackie Robinson changed your life, or how, like, what kind of impact did it have on you as a person? Mm -hmm. um. Well, it's completely changed my life. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what, what way has it not changed my life? Um, I mean, I wouldn't be here on the stage with Harrison Ford and Mrs. Robinson and Brian Helgeland had I not played the role, first of all. And um, I think in terms of my understanding about it, it, when you play someone who who lives so courageously and um, 
it, it, it when, when I when I uh, think about what he did, um, you know, we go home and we watch um, Sports Center at night, or well, at least I do. Um, <laughs> a lot of you do too. Uh, you 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 have your favorite players. You have um, the clutch moments that you sort of, you know, play back over and over that a player um, does during the course of a game. But he didn't just do it on, on the field. He, he lived a clutch life, you know. He had clutch moments in his everyday life because when he left the ball field, um, there were people that were scrutinizing him on a different level. When he was going to the ball field, scrutinizing him on a different level. In the film, we, we um, uh, Nicole Bahari, who plays Rachel Robinson uh, in the movie, we talked about this sort of sacred space that, that they had to have at home. But as soon as he stepped outside that sacred space, he had to live in the clutch. Um, and so just uh, understanding that heightened reality, um, it makes you not, you know, the things that you worry about on a day-to-day -day basis, they, they, they seem like futile to a certain degree. Like you, you're able to sort of rise to the occasion in a way because you play someone who does that? It gives you a sense of courage. And I think ultimately that's why we watch movies. Um, you watch movies uh, to walk in the shoes of the protagonist or the hero. Um, and also to see when you're not, when you're the other characters sometimes too. Um, but it's not just me playing it, it's also you watching it. And uh, I think that's, you know, I, I feel blessed to have had the opportunity to do that. I'll take one from over here. Um, this is from Mrs. Robinson. Um, how involved were you with the making of the movie? I think I, ha I, think I had, I know I had, uh, an appropriate consulting role. And I, I wanted to be a consultant. I didn't want to make the decisions. I was in no, no position, didn't, didn't have the knowledge or of, the, of the field or anything that would make uh, me feel I should make the decisions, their film. But I also wanted to be involved as a consultant, mostly around to see that things were authentic, um, and to make any corrections that I needed to make around um, attitudes. So I, I did my work mostly with Brian uh, through sending him notes about the script and, um, and then stayed, stepped back and let them do their work and they, they did a great job. Can we take another question from about midway back in this section? Great. Um, I have a question for Ms. Robinson. Uh, what was your first reaction when your husband told you he was gonna be the first black male in Major League Baseball? Uh, he called me from uh, New York. I was in Los Angeles and he called me uh, from New York to tell me they had just met with Mr. Ricky and that Mr. Ricky had made this offer to him, which was uh, out of the blue and not expected and um, tremendous. And he said I was not to tell anyone because Mr. Ricky wanted to make an announcement and we had to keep it a secret. I was thrilled uh, for several reasons. One, because this sounded like a real opportunity, but also it meant we could get married. <laughs> and I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> so it, uh, it, it uh, just sent us into, uh, into space in terms of being excited. And um, he, we got together as soon as we could after that so that 
uh, we could plan our marriage along with planning his entry into baseball. Can we take a question up, up front? Is there a mic nearby? Thank you. Um, this question is for Mr. Bozeman. Uh, I was wondering, I'm, I'm not a professional actor, so I, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but uh, in order to convey emotions accurately and with, with great power, one must, um, I believe, uh, draw upon one's own experiences. Uh, was there ever a time uh, while filming this movie that you had to draw upon your own experiences in order to convey the, the struggles that Jackie Robinson has gone through in his life? Uh, yes, yes, um, how do I even answer that, like, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, there's several answers, I, tr I try to do it quickly, um, one, you, it's, it's not as complicated as people make it, um, it, as people, like, sort of imagine it to be, uh, I think all you need is, as, Harrison Ford is, has eloquently said, is the person that's in front of you um, and your imagination in, in, in a good scene. You know, the words and the context that's already, that's given to you, a lot of times is enough. Um, because, because you have that ability as a, as a person to sort of um, create realities. So even if you haven't experienced, because I mean, if I, if I was playing uh, a bank robber, I've never robbed a bank before. You know, if I'm play, playing a doctor, you know, I didn't study, I didn't go to medical school. Um, so there are a lot of times when there is not a, a exact parallel um, between you and the character. Uh, now, have I experienced racism before? Yes, um, I'm from the South. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, a use of the N word in the movie. I've been called that before and not in a colloquial context. You know, we change the meanings of that word a lot of times and, and, uh, and sometimes somebody will say that word and they, they say they're calling you their friend. I'm saying I've, I've been called it in with, the, with the same intentions. Um, but I, I think, you know, for the most part, um, in doing this movie, everything was already there. You know, the racism is not dead. So it's not like there's, there's a gap that you have to bridge between the past and the present, but it's not dead. And so all you have to do is sort of peel back, um, the reality that, that we already live in. Um, in order to reach um, where these characters are. Um, and I still don't know whether or not we found everything that's there, but I think what I love about this movie is that it gives you the opportunity to feel some of it too. So I mean, I, that's a, I don't know if that's a, a true answer, but um, that's the best I can do for you right now. <laughs> All right, we have time for one last question. Um, here in the back. This is for Ms. Robinson. Um, in the movie, I noticed that Jack and Robinson was a tough person, but in reality, what was he like? He was a tough person. <laughs> <laughs> he was a strong person. I like that better than tough. Um, he was, he had a very strong personality. He had, uh, he would make commitments and keep them. Um, he was courageous in many ways and um, he was very determined. He was determined to see that he could do or would be able to do what he had the opportunity to do. And so he was strong in, in, in those ways and strong in his uh, values and his beliefs. He was a very religious man and believed in God and believed that God had uh, a strong influence in, in what happened to him. And uh, so that I think that helped him a great deal. And then he could make 
commitments to others. To me, uh, to Branch Rickey, uh, he, he could make uh, relationships count and made uh, them important as a part of his life. So that he had all those uh, strengths and um, he, he never smoked, he never drank, he even talked against drinking. I mean, he'd go to a cocktail party and the lady would say, at the hostess would say, what will you have to drink? He said, I don't drink. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was a little stuffy about that. <laughs> but, uh, but his beliefs were his beliefs and he would, uh, he would fight for them. That is a great way to end. Thank you all so much, and let's give these folks a big round of applause.